Hi, everybody, and welcome to TNM Coaching, Interconnected and Zoran Todorovic podcast. I'm so grateful and happy to have you again with us. Thank you so much for liking, for coming back into our podcast week after week, for also commenting and for increasing our followership on Spotify, when is our biggest home and biggest fan base. So thank you so much for listening. As always, we are here to empower you, to elevate your heart, to elevate your soul, to elevate your thoughts, the next level of beyond and to become this best possible version of the human being that you are, to be absolutely amazing and outstanding. And today we have this wonderful guest. He's a dear friend of mine. You know, we had a lot of encounters throughout our life journey. Sometimes we get closer and we have this intense conversation, then life takes us apart, then we come close again. And I always felt I wanted to invite Ian Abel to come to my podcast because I love what he's standing for. I love who he is. I love what he represents. And he's always, always, always inspirational to me. So sometimes when I think about my own creativity, where I am in my own life journey, how can I become more creative? How can I learn from somebody who is so raw, clear, open, and honest about the creative process I think about? Ian, he's the founder of Based Upon, which is the London-based art and design studio. They pioneered in the new era of luxury when the meaning, legacy, and craftsmanship came together and converged together, which is really interesting. When you see their Instagram and everything they're standing for, all the sculptures they're creating and all the art pieces they're creating, it's really, really interesting. He's also a thought leader, you know, when it comes to creativity and how do we define creativity. He's created a signature uh, objects that symbolizes the true nature and true value of our creativity as well. Once again, you can see this on, on their social media websites and Instagram as well. And then clients around the world, collectors, global brands resonate with his work and they usually come to Ian and his team to custom and to uh, ask them to tailor and bespoke certain art pieces for whatever they want to express at this given moment in time. Before he embarked in this creative journey in his life and based upon, he also has background in philosophy, politics, and economics from Oxford University, and he was also working with a business consultancy as well. So he's, again, one of these multidimensional human beings now currently in based upon expressing his creativity. Even Ian, welcome to this recording. Glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Zorna. Thank you for that lovely intro. So, yeah, I mean, you know, for me, as I said, your inspiration when it comes to the creativity. So I was wondering, I mean, my first kind of big question to you, what is that pivotal moment in your life when you recognize and realize the profound impact on creativity in your own life and in other people's lives? So how, what really happened in your life journey to get to where you are right now? I was always fascinated with creativity. And I was always, I always admired creative people, but I considered myself separate to them. I thought that, that the creative people were the people who had particular talents or gifts. I observed the level that they were working at. So somebody producing great art or great music or great, great theater and saw a huge gap between what I could do or what I could in that and therefore counted myself counted myself out but this this faith in creativity didn't didn't go away for me so I was trying to find a way in even though I'd had no training so I left school having done no art no design no, no music. Um, and there are reasons for that which we can which we can get to but effectively had no skills and I came from a family that never I don't recall ever being given a coloring pad and pens and been suggested that I draw or given some clay and suggested that I try and make something. It wasn't, it came from a very kind of work class uh, origin in the northeast of England, which wasn't really the way that we, that we thought about the world. So I was, I was, so I'm looking from afar at this thing called creativity and I managed to get myself through school, ended up in Oxford doing, doing, doing philosophy. So my route in was more through ideas. I knew that I was really into ideas and the power of ideas, and I was fascinated, fascinated with with ideas and the value that they that they held. So I thought that that would be my route in. And so, having done it, tried it, tried a couple of things, I ended up becoming signing up and becoming a management consultant because I figured it would be a way that I would be able to learn 
enough about how business work that I could help other people bring good ideas into reality. Um, but then when I got into, into working for consultancies, people were starting to talk about, it was the early days, mid nineties, just before first internet, um, boom, people were starting to talk about the power of knowledge, knowledge management, the knowledge economy was starting to be discussed as we were starting to understand that there was a, there was a value in ideas and a value in intellectual capital. Um, so that interested me. And, and I was thinking, it's not what about if there's value in managing knowledge and sharing knowledge, what value is there in being able to create new knowledge? Like where does that come from? The stuff that we ultimately end up sharing. I mean, what if companies could be better at that? What if we get to the point? And then I started to understand actually these big companies, they don't understand creativity. They don't have a create, they don't have a creative culture. They're actually often as anyone who's worked in corporate will know that they're, they're often very conformist to the point of feeling really quite restrictive. So I'm thinking, how do we loosen that and open that up? And I did a little bit of work on that, worked with a few companies to try and help them be better at creating new ideas. And then, uh, and then in that first internet boom in the nineties, late nineties, people started forming tech incubators, which were much more about how do we accelerate ideas? Take a good that. Good. How do, how do we bring it through? So I turned up at the door of one of those and said, look, what you're doing is the way that I think, can I, can I come and be part of it? Um, and I did that. And then obviously the, 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 that first internet boom in whatever it was early 2000 kind of crashed. Right. And a lot of that. And so the incubator shrunk in size to just to back to its founders. And I realized at that point, look, I need to. I, I, I need to face this and I need to face it. Actually, me being a champion of creativity is not enough. Mm -hmm. Be advocating for the power of ideas and creativity. I need to commit and I need to find a create. I need to find a creative voice. So there I was at the end, the kind of late 20s, unskilled and untrained, concluding I need to find a, a creative voice. Wow. <laughs> so you arrived at that pivotal moment by saying to yourself, I need to find my creative voice. It's not enough for me to champion. It's not enough for me to support it from the consultancy point of view or to empower other people. Now it's time for me to start doing it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you began, right? Is that just as simple as that? You just jump into it. That was a choice. It was a decision. Was it like you kind of fallen into it? What really happened? Yeah, it was a decision. And I thought because I couldn't draw pain, sing, dance, play an instrument, I thought that I would have to write. Like I thought that writing would be my uh would be my way in. Um so I worked on that I worked on that for a while. And the sort of liberating moment for me was um that I really felt and I don't know if people relate to this, but it goes back again to that kind of being being in that corporate culture of not feeling within the corporate world that you can be fully honest, yeah, fully authentic. Mm. The level of acting that we're expected to do, the conformity is subtle enough that it's really quite unsettling because we're definitely playing a role to be a, you know, whatever company we work for, a BT person or a Shell person or Anderson Consulting person or even worse, you'd probably people like a Google person or, you know, these, these current big brands where there's a real expectation of, of what that means. But then, but then, but then there's the sense of restriction, you know, and if you step outside of that, you're somehow doing, you're potentially doing damage to the corporation. So we're all operating within this, this, this kind of limiting framework. So it's quite unsettling because we're pretending to not, everybody's pretending to be a fully authentic self. But actually, then feeling feeling restricted, and that for me, that, the subtlety of that for me was was troubling. Um, and I I knew I was carrying this, you know, carrying this around with, um, and I would become increasingly uncomfortable in the workplace. And um, and I'd start to dread having to be in the workplace, and it would get to the point where you know, even walking to work, I'd start to feel this sort of sense of of dread and discomfort. 
And uh, and I carried that with me even through having left the incubator and gone off and I did a bit of I did a bit of travelling and I ended up, I ended up in Puglia in the south of Italy, where I was renting a really simple little whitewashed house overlooking the sea, living mm-hmm. the, getting up at five a.m. trying to get a thousand two to two thousand words of a novel down on paper. Um, and I remember the day of sitting in a cafe there in an old cobbled square. And I spoke next to no, no Italian. And somebody ended up starting a conversation with me and saying, and so and eventually they said to me, you know, what, what, do, you, what do you do? Or I think they might be able to say, what are you? And I remember saying for the very, very first time, I said, Sano wants to be thought it, which means I am a writer. Mm. In the moment of actually owning that, I felt this thing lift that I realized that I'd been, that I'd been carrying. Now, the truth is, what do I mean by I'm a, I'm a writer? I didn't have anything published. I didn't have a book deal signed. I wasn't being paid by anybody for my writing. There was nothing there that, that was measurable. But in that moment, by making that commitment to say, now, I, in this moment, I consider myself to be a writer. I am a writer. Was this was this release. And I realized in that moment, I'd never felt as comfortable in my own skin as I did in that particular moment of making that, of making that decision. So having done that and I completed a couple of writing projects and then, and then, uh, when I came back to, uh, London, um, I'd been, uh, I'd done, I'd been in India for three months and I, I discovered two wonderful writing projects there that I, I thought I was going to continue with, but I came back to London and I have a twin brother mm-hmm. and my twin brother and I had always said we would do something together. And I'd kind of gone on this kind of quite empowering personal journey where I'd shed myself, you know, what was expected of me and was ready to face living a creative life. Um, but having a twin, I kind of kind of thought, well, if I go off and do that now, am I taking him, you know, what am I, what about him? You know? Exactly. Am I taking him with me? Or is he? Does he want to come with me on this, on this journey? So we, he and I, started to explore what that would mean if this was something that we were going to do together. And obviously, being twins, there are a lot of parallels. We're not identical twins, but there, there are a lot of parallels in terms of the. While we think differently, and we see the world differently, there are a lot of parallels in the kind of the challenges the universe has thrown to us. We've probably yeah. been through most of the. Yeah. It's a journey, would you say, like a common story of, of the obstacles of the hero's journey of your life. It's of the aligned and gives you the similar things, right? Exactly. We've both, we followed that kind of, I suppose, the archetype of the hero's journey um, within a relatively similar time frame, although the specific challenges that we face are different, but they have that same archetypal uh, dynamic. Um, so, yes, yeah, so we, we, we decided that we would, that we would explore, um, doing something together and it was like, so what do we both want? And he was like, I want to, I feel like he'd been working in, he'd also worked in the early internet in a startup that was all about content from publishing. He'd worked for some branding companies and he'd worked for a big corporate as well. Um, and uh, he was like, I want, you know what? I just want to do something where at the end of the day, when we get to the end of a day, I can look back at what we've done that day. And there's a physicality to it. I can see something that we've made, something that we've changed. Um, and he'd, he'd had a lot of fun when he was out in Australia, similar time when I was in Italy, so certainly he was working with a landscaper. He was like, I just love it. I love the physicality of it. I love spending three hours digging and then having to transport that soil that we've dug to another part of the doing and all that physicality, seeing the ship that we've literally moved some land. He said, that's what I want from my, from my life, that tangibility. And I'm saying, you know, I relate to that and I, like to be doing something where with, with also where we see we see output but i also to me narrative is really important and, and storytelling um and by this point because of the work i've done on creativity and you know, i had a lot of faith in creativity as a process and how you could use process to get to end result um and also the power of, of collaborative creativity and what you could achieve by bringing a group of uniquely minded individuals together, you put those people together in a space and you make space 
for them to create and you have some sense of process and some sense of facilitation, you can make incredible things happen as you, as you will see, I'm sure in the work that you do, yeah. you'll score all the time. Um, so that kind of seeded into, well, hold on a minute. We don't necessarily need, what if, what if we, what if we build a, a ban? If we see the making of, if we see the making of art and design, which we want to do, yeah. if we see that not as expecting us to be solo artists that have got all of the answers that are going to write everything and sing everything and play every single instrument, mm -hmm. what if we form a band and we take our place within the band and we allow whatever the band is at that moment in time, whatever skill sets it's got, what if we allow that to be the parameters of the album that we go out and make? And if over time we bring in somebody who plays, you know, the Armenian dude up really beautifully, then maybe that finds its way onto that particular album at that moment in time. But it doesn't exactly. mean not that I need to know how to play the judo. No. And of course, in music, this is completely accepted, right? Nobody thinks, nobody thinks twice about a musical artist who says, yeah, I'm in a band and I'm playing a role and I made my contribution. In the world of physical art, particularly in the art world, it's not really, we're not, we're not there yet mm -hmm. where it's seen as acceptable to. Mm -hmm. uh, to make art in that way. But, you know, having been on non-school, we really didn't know the difference, Rich and I, between art and design. We didn't really know things were done. We didn't understand anything about the history of art. We didn't understand the art world. We didn't know any art artists were. So we were able to come to it quite naively um, and ask probably naive questions that other people would have already conditioned out themselves. And some of that, you know, some some of that freshness and then that faith in collaboration, really, the, the the origin of what what became based upon. And I love that in innocence, in, in a way that this lack of conditioning, as you said, what you know, the art world represents when it comes to traditional schooling and what you need to go through and everything that you need to understand and know about art, kind of conditions out of us this innocence uh, that you are re representing that kind of organically got you into this conversation by itself, you know, so it's beautiful to witness that as well. Yeah. So, so you mentioned two things that are really important that you trusted creativity as the process. And then you also discovered the collaboration and power of collaboration in creative processes. So tell me a little bit more about this creativity as a process. What did you discover? What, what, what is that about? Because some people don't even think in those terms. So I just would like to unpack this a little bit, if that's okay. Yeah, I think what I've noticed is, and again, it comes out of what I noticed in myself. So you, we, when we, we judge, uh, we, look at, we look at the work that creators doing. We mm -hmm. go over the, so we go over the, whatever, we go to the Museum of Modern Art, we go to the Royal Opera House or whatever, and we go and what witness something. Mm. Incredible. You know, what an amazing creation that is. And then we measure our own ideas against that, which is ridiculous, right? Because that which we've gone to see is the product of many, many hours, often years, yeah? many, many people, often which have changed over time as new teams are brought in, and normally lots, lots and lots of money. And so we see that and we go, oh, well, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. And we turn the tap off. But the reality, if we had access to that budget, we had access to all of that incredible talent that's involved at the various stages to bring, to bring that together. Um, not could we create that output, but could we credibly play a role somewhere within it, you mm -hmm. know? And that's why, I mean, I think, and I have to do this with the people that, you know, with, with, with the people that come to, come to work for us here. One of the first things I, I work with them on is understanding what the, crea the creative process is. So to get from something, by the time we get to get to the Royal Opera House or an artist's show at the museum, it goes through a series of, I think it goes through kind of five principal stages. The first stage is, is curiosity, in which the thinker, the creative, the artist, is out relating to the world in a way, noticing something which, which, which kind of makes them think, okay, my, the way I, I'm, I'm thinking about this in a way that's interesting enough for me that I want to develop an idea out of it. Mm. It's so, something I, I'm open and I'm curious, 
and I'm starting to form a view. And so as it moves out of curiosity, it moves into conceptualization. So having started open, I'm now having an idea, which might be in a very, very basic form. That idea might be a feeling. It might be what just feels like a, a, an odd hunch. It might be a sketch. It might be a series of words. It might be a mark on paper. It might be a line of music. You know, it may simply be a kind of odd question that just won't, that won't go away. That's all it is at that point, right? And then that conceptualization is then developed in normally into something which can be shared because inevitably on any of these large projects that we're talking about, the things that we go to see, they are the, the, the work of many people. So the creative has to be able to share that with others. So it has to be in a form in which it can be shared. And that might be a more developed thesis or it might be a more developed visual idea in which it can be shared. And then you can start to bring the team in that's going to allow you to make it to actually make it work. You know, if we're going to go and do a huge production of the Royal Opera House, however many people we've got in choreography and in casting and all of the players themselves and all of the actors, that's all of those people need to be brought into that project. And therefore, the idea needs to be shaped enough to say, look, do you want to come and be part of this? But it's still only a very, very loose sketch at that point, but it's enough that they come in and it starts to, be, starts to become real. So it moves out of conceptualization into craft, which is what we normally, what I think, what we normally think of is when we think of creativity, which is where now we're skillful people are now actually doing stuff. So as an artist, if you had an idea for a sculpture of a moon that would, um, you know, that, that, that would illuminate and glow in a certain way that was related to the changing tides on an island on the other side of the world where your moon was, and you wanted to make that work, you're going to have to engage with the people who have got the technology to measure the changing tides and transfer that into a form of data, which can talk to a lighting system. And you may also want to work with people who are gifted enough to make a sculpture of that size that's actually going to work and be stable outdoors, et cetera, et cetera. You may or may not have the skills to craft that moon in clay and say, yeah, look, I'll make a model of it. You may or may not. You may not need to if you're talking about the moon, but you're unlikely to have all of the digital and technical skills to do, um, you know, to, to do the, 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 full, the full extent of, of what's needed. But you're kind of, you know, you're there and you're holding it together, but you're suddenly you're relying on intense craft skills, either in yourself or in others. And then it moves out of craft, the craft phase into what I call the curation phase, where that's about how is this thing being presented to the world? which is, again, totally fundamental because you could build this, your, your project, with your, your, you know, your, 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 your amazing sculpture, and your moon, but without someone who's going to get that put in the right place at the right time and make sure the right people come and have the right level of interest generated by around the world, it, 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 it's either never going to become known or it's not going to become known well enough that you're going to be, you're going to be able to make another, make another project. Which leads on to the fifth wit thing, which is commercialization, which is just which is is the reality. You, if you're going to invest your time and you're going to bring other people into your vision, and you're going to build this amazing project. If it isn't presented correctly, and ultimately it doesn't make some money, then you can't roll the dice again. You can only go again if you've actually managed some level of commercial success. That's you, and that. That's the stuff that we go to see. That's mm. not necessarily there in living a creative life does not mean initiating a project at curiosity stage and seeing it all the way through commercialization. It's just recognizing that that's the actual creative process that we judge ourselves against when we go to see work in the world and that all stages of that are valid. And I can be living a creative life if my skill is within the curation sector of it. Because I'm the one that's doing that job. You know, this is how we frame it. This is how we present it. This is why people then come. Or my job is in the commercialization aspect of it. That's where I'm really strong, and therefore that's what I'm going to do. Or my job is in the craft phase, the bit we understand really well. But more importantly, I think I think what's potentially new here um, is, or was certainly wasn't. I didn't. I did, didn't feel open to me. Is that curiosity phase and the conceptualization phase are really, really valid 
even if you don't have the craft skills and the curation skills and the commercialization skills to develop that. So if you need to collaborate with others to make that work, that's as equally valid as someone who says, look, I'm a great drummer, but it's very one-dimensional if all of my albums only have a solo you know, drummer on it. It's just not enough. But if actually, as the drummer, I can form a band or I can form an orchestra, then I can be part of, part of creating something. And I think knowing that, that even the curiosity is, is enough is stage one, you know? It's okay to be curious about the world, right? It's okay to doubt the world. It's okay to see the world differently. It's important not to judge that stuff too too early because that's what we do. Like we don't really think, do we think, do we think it's all right to really doubt the world and question the world and, and, and mm-hmm. so on? Well, we probably say, yeah, we do. But the system we've been through, does it really support that? You know, when you think about when when we think about if we say creativity is about not about artistic output or cultural output, but about seeing the world differently, bringing a fresh approach to solving problems, whether that be in the world of art or whether that be in the world of medical science, not be with charity or politics or social transformation or personal transformation or whatever it is, right? It's all about that ability to see something slightly differently and, and then follow that through. Um but if we go back to like, we think about what it's like in, in, in school, why was someone, I was never noticed as a creative because I was deemed to be trouble for asking too many questions. <laughs> I got a little bit of revenge on that not long ago, but <laughs> oh, school, a school asked me, a really prominent London school, one of London's top schools that deemed to be one of its most creative schools. And it's got an amazing alumni of people that have gone on and had significant, really significant careers. but. They asked me, they said, we really want to embrace more, but we see the world changing so fast around us. You know, tech is changing at this rate and AI is coming in. And, you know, we, we, we know that we need to embrace creativity. Will you help us? Can we come and you do something with us? I said, yeah, great. Come on, I'll host you. Come to the studio. We'll run a day together and I'll help you move through some, move through some things. And, and we talked through one of these, what, 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 one of the, a number of the, these principles. Um, and we also did, which you'd love, we also did some kind of stillness work together to help them understand how to actually create space and really create, try and create that openness. So it was, it was, it was quite, uh, it was, I think it was, it, it, it was quite, it was, it was probably more, more varied than they thought it was going to be. But anyway, we get to the point where I'm standing, but so you, so, okay, so this is about, you, know, you want to build the leaders of the future. Yeah, 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 great. You want to build the, the innovators of tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want, to, you want to be the school that breeds the disruptors. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And I said, okay, so what do you do when you want to breed the innovators? What do you do with the innovative kids? We said, well, we celebrate them and we give them awards, whatever. I said, you want to build disruptors? Yeah. What do you do with the disruptive kids? And they're like, okay, yeah, we throw them out, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so what would it mean if the disruptive kids yeah, at the front of the class, what if the kid asking the really annoying question was asked to set this week's essay? Exactly. Yes, exactly. What if? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it is usually that's the case. You know, the disruptors are there for a reason. They need to ask those questions. They need to shake the energy. They need to shake the conversation, get it to the next level. Absolutely. And we do need to embrace, you know, and, and all of the functionalities of creativity. Love it. Love it that you use that example. Now, tell me, when we kind of were preparing, we talked about beyond this curiosity, uh, conceptualization, craft curation, and commercialization, which is five C's of creativity that I really, really love. This whole process is so important, especially for the people that are not perceiving themselves as creatives. And I love how you manage to language that curiosity. It's super important. It needs to be nourished and loved and appreciated and give the space, given space. And, and what I wanted to ask you that, you know, in our life, you also mentioned that, you know, we do need to make a choice, which is the big thing for me, to choose creativity. That was one thing that I really want to unpack. And then following that choice that, how can we open to become a channel and the conduit? So can you first tell me a little bit about that notion of choosing and then surrendering into this 
we'll see what language comes out of you when you can really channel and conduit, become a conduit for creativity. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, with it, with, with, with seeing it as a choice. I, I, the analogy that landed for me that made me understand that was like, if you said to, if a child that you love came to you and said, you know, the people I have made most in the world are the creative people, but I'm not creative or mm. creative bone in my body. I suspect that most caregivers would say to that child, don't worry about that. You've got loads of other valuable skills. You're really analytical and you're, you know, really, you're a good leader and you're loyal and faithful. I suspect that's what they would say. If that same child went to that same caregiver and said, the people I admire most in the world are the courageous ones. The brave people are the people that I really have my, I'm not courageous. I don't have any courage. What would the caregiver say? <laughs> of course you're courageous. Course. You can be courageous. You just need to choose to be courageous. Exactly. And look how conditioned it is that the caregiver isn't saying, of course you're creative. Mm. You just choose to be creative. Mm -hmm. They're already telling you, oh, don't worry about that. Yeah, no, you haven't got that because actually the creative, that kid over there that happens to be good at holding a colored pencil, they're mm -hmm. green because look what they can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, within the history of creativity, you know, we, we, we know collectively that we, we, we know that the, the culture, if we're just talking about where it, it, it existed or it's culture, all, all ideas, all fields. At those pivotal moments in which a paradigm shifts, mm -hmm. the, uh, the pioneer within the paradigm is normally considered to be a heretic. Exactly. Right? Um, or I think it was um, maybe George Bernard Shaw said, all great truths begin as blasphemies. Mm -hmm. Right? So when we find a new style appearing in, in, in painting and in art or a new style appearing in music. What, 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 what does the established order say? Oh, that's not art. That's not music. That's just noise. That's just people talking. This is awful. You know what I mean? And then suddenly it comes through and so it goes and it evolves and, and it develops. So therefore, on an individual level, if somebody who considers himself not creative has an idea or makes a piece of work, speaks a few words or, or says something and the world says, that's not art. That person goes, oh, I knew that. I knew I didn't have what it takes. Actually, what if that's not art in this case means you just happen to be way ahead of your time. You're at the beginning of this paradigm. Mm. We know that X number of artists died penniless because their work wasn't understood in their lifetime, and it takes time. So what does it mean to trust that? What does it mean to trust that my the world is going to tell me when I make something or offer something out, the world's going to really force me to say, that's not art. In the same way that, you know, people making punk music or people making rock and roll were told the same. Mm -hmm. But then what does it also mean to trust that I may not even I may not even be able to validate that in my own lifetime? Because mm -hmm. if it's really great, I may have to die never knowing. But it will be my descendants that know that what I did or what I thought was really, really valuable for, for humankind. Mm -hmm. And what does it also mean just to know that I simply can't judge it because the truth of what, what, what appears to be the case is that we each, we're each unique enough. Obviously, we're all, we're, all, we're, all, we're all formed from similar building blocks and similar patterns and formed together in different permutations that, that generate some level of uniqueness. But we seem to be unique enough to be able to conclude, yeah, we're all individual and that which we, which we are is all, is, is all, all singularly different. So we all have a unique filter through which life passes. And therefore, that which comes out of any of us is always going to be subtly different because anything that comes out of you is a product of what you've experienced via your filter. And anything from me is a product of what I've experienced and via my filter. Yeah. And we know that we can't judge that either. Because yeah. I don't know about you, I don't know what you're like when you watch these things back and you see yourself. I don't know whether you find that lovely or, or uncomfortable. A lot of people, you know, I do quite a bit of... Um, 
we make a lot of films with him based upon, and I end up narrating them. And I don't, I don't like the sound of my own voice. I don't, <laughs> I don't like to listen to it. I know lots of actors who say they can't even watch what the, what what they've made. Um, so we can't. For me, it boils down to self love. I, I have had that when I was working on television. You know, first time, just kind of a short summary there. When I was see, I saw myself and I listened to my own voice when I was working on TV. I, I was horrified. I could yeah. not believe that everybody in the room were saying how good I was yeah. at that moment in time and, you know, how eloquent and how clear my voice was. And I was the only thing I was thinking, my God, who is this person on the screen? And why does he sound like that? And exactly. why is everybody saying that he's good? <laughs> yeah. But you throw that in the mix. So basically any idea you have, may, the world may say it's not art, music or relevant or it's not science. Even now that's not science. Yeah. Get into all of that. Um, <laughs> but and that just simply may be that you're a pioneer. Or it may be that you are a pioneer, but you're never even going to get it validated because of the, the time span. Or it may be that you simply can't judge it. Because what you see is too familiar to you. You can't see the exoticness in it. You can't, you don't have the objectivity and see the beauty in it. So you consider it, you consider it rubbish. So yeah. any human being mm. on this planet should believe, therefore, statistically, that they have a chance that anything that comes out of them, mm. should they let it come out, should they let it germinate inside, should they let it emerge, has a good chance that the world is going to say either now or very soon or later. He's going to say that's that's a thing of beauty. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Wow, that's that's let let get this kind of ooh, because that's a profound statement there. <laughs> that needs to be said in all of our consciousness. Beautifully said, beauty. I really, really, really believe that from my own experience, and I really want to believe that. And this is how I govern and run my creative life as well. That you know, it it, it will have an impact. And I also believe that we all have a contribution to make on a certain level. You know, my understanding of creativity from a collaborative, collective point of view is that we do all have a significant piece to play. You know, each and every of us inside of ourselves has this unique essence that we call our soul and our soul is supposed to interact, supposed to play, supposed to be in this uh, mosaic of our lives. So if I initiate and activate my creativity in collaborative processes and I show up in the five C's, whatever I am, Prapman or conceptualization or I'm super good in commercialization of the whole process, my contribution is is there. And I think that it boils down to me that we need to give ourselves permission to contribute our creativity within the bigger pot and express ourselves as much as possible and let go of all these narratives that box us in that we are not as significant, as important, as creative as we can be, right? Exactly. And sometimes it's enough to be the catalyst. Mm. And I don't, lots of people probably, we understand the catalyst is based on maybe more than others because we make quite a bit of the work we make, we make with resins or, you know, um, re polymer based uh, materials. So we have often something that you think of as the resin, which is a big gloopy liquid, which we might add colors to to make you know, various artworks. And then we have, which, which might be a whole pot this size, which we're then going to start pouring to make, make it, make an artwork. And we add to that a few drops of a catalyst. So then the, the, the volume of, if the volume of the, the resin is X, then the, 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 the volume of the catalyst is something like 0 0.01 of X. I mean, it, 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 it's so tiny that you wouldn't notice it. But without that drop of the catalyst, that resin, it's never going to harden. It's never going to go up. So the artwork is simply never made. It just becomes a tray of gloopy liquid that you can't do the next process to because oh, we're doing this over layers and layers and layers. Mm -hmm. Simply can't continue. Now, that, that catalyst's role, that catalyst may look at it and say, I'm nothing. Look at that huge pot and look at me, this one single drop. But yeah. without it, it doesn't exist. And it's not that it's more important than the resin. It's that it, mm -hmm. it's, a part of the, it's a part of the process. And I think 
for somebody to be able to say, yeah, what do you do? Do you live a creative life? Yeah, I live a creative life. What do you do? I'm a catalyst. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, let's go and explore the, but what if that's okay? Or I live a creative life. What do you do? I'm a curious person. What's that? I ask odd questions. I ask, I ask what are perceived, what are considered to be, to be difficult questions. You know, Einstein said, I think, what if I were to run at the speed of light, holding a mirror, looking at my own reflection, what would I see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. He also went on and said, if you have um, a difficult problem to solve, if you give me a really difficult problem to solve and you give me one hour to do it, I'll spend 55 minutes thinking not of an answer, but of questions. Because when I find the right question, I know become a key to unlock the answer. So the questioner mm -hmm. is fundamental within this entire creative process. But are the schools, where's the, where's the lesson where they're saying we want to build questions? We're going to nurture amazing questioning and amazing curiosity. Why would that not be as valid as learning a foreign language? Of course, of course. In the future, we'll make sure it is. <laughs> or in the now, we'll make sure it is. Yeah. I'm sure that will count the time. So as we're coming closer to our conversation, we can expand this to three hours. And, you know, recently I had, uh, you know, very beautiful woman on the podcast, Joe, and she is, she's somebody who teaches other people how to make podcasts. And then she told me, <laughs> you need to keep the format shorter, otherwise we're going to lose the audience. And she was so funny because she told me, man, when they come on the podcast, they can talk for three hours. And I said, that's exactly what it is. We can talk for three hours and more and more and more. And she was funny. She said, make it shorter. So we are now getting into the space when we kind of closing up a little bit. My last question to you is like, I really love what you shared about being a channel, you know, being open to something outside of you, which is going to land in your consciousness understanding that you're not creator, but that you are channeling this energy and that you are making this energy present, which is a beautiful spiritual notion as well. It's like sort of meditation when you surrender yourself on a certain level and you remove your ego, which is I am, you know, writer, I am conduit, I am a curious person, but you surrender yourself to something else. I would just love you to talk a little bit on that because I think it's, this is such a beautiful, poetic way of, of experiencing the whole creative process. So tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, and that, that is the way that I work. I mean, the, the way that I create now and the way that I've learned to, to work is to go out off, off normally into landscape, you know, in, in, into nature and to give enough time and space for something to land and then when it lands, to notice it landing. And to notice it landing, I think to me, it's a little bit like a leaf landing on a lake. Mm -hmm. So to notice it is, takes a level, of, a level of attention. But it also takes a level of faith to know that when, they, when you feel that something small landing, actually I can bring attention mm -hmm. to it. I'm not just going to assume, it's like the cactus, I'm not going to assume it to be meaningless. It's very, very small. I'm going to mm -hmm. recognize that these things arrive very small and very, very quiet and often very, very informed. But there's something that I've now learned, and it's kind of, it's not here. It doesn't land here. <laughs> this mm -hmm. might do computation and might, you know, do some fathoming and some shaping and, and that clearly has a role to play. But the landing is kind of more in here, and that's mm -hmm. where, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where I'm going to kind of feel something. And I've, 20 years in, I know I can trust it. And I know however odd it seems, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, the thing that lands does not relate to the end product. It's not about material, your form or scale or anything like that. It's something really, really tiny. Yeah, you know, I was out in a landscape and I noticed in a vast landscape, we can maybe show some imagery of this. And I noticed a tiny mark out, out in a wild island in the Irish Sea. And there was just a tiny mark within the limestone that looked like a scar in human flesh. I was out there. We traveled there. I had two guys with me from the team, a um, load of film equipment, all the stuff. You know, we're there. This is all the critics saying, you better come up with a bloody big idea because, you know, there's, there's three of you out here for a week. This is going to have to be something really good. And, you know, it's kind of rushing ahead to what a, a body of work might be. 
but actually the inner knowing just said, look at that, look at that thing there, isn't that beautiful? In the vastness, this tiny little mark that looked like a, a human scar. And because I know to trust that, learn to trust it, able to say, guys, I want to stop you. I want to document this thing. Just the sense of cast it, make casts of it, photographed it, drone, shot it, whatever, and really trust that. I still didn't know what it was going to do. And then mm-hmm. didn't know not to then start thinking like, oh, what's this going to become? Allowing the fact that that tiny mark becoming a body of work could be 12 months, 24 months, 30 months, whatever it needs to be. But just knowing that it was precious. So collect it. Just keep it for now. Just take it. Let's let let's let's have it as, as something that's being collected in landscape. And uh, over time, allow it to speak and allow it to form. And it became a really profound body of work about, you know, nature trying to communicate back that, hold on a minute, that vulnerability, that you that wound that you recognize in human flesh, you saw a big scar on on on, on Zoran's arm, you'd say, you know, gosh, Zoran, what happened? And I'd know that there'd been some some significant event and that there'd been some recovery and healing through that, right? So, but mm-hmm. this tiny mark in the vast landscape, you know, was actually saying the same thing. And it was saying, what if, what if I too breathe? What if you don't see me breathing because you see me as rock and from the perspective of your life, I probably don't change very much in the 80, 90 years that you're here. But if you shift your perspective in geological time, you'll see that these huge cracks that you're peering into, they open and they close again, and they break apart, and they drip, and they reform, and they become solid again. And Earth is is going through that same process of, you know, expanding and contracting, of of of, uh, of, of separating and coming back together that we observe really easily in the expansion and the contraction of of, of the lungs. So it became this whole series about the breath and. Using, using landscape to activate the breath. You've actually sat with one of the pieces of me that we sat yeah. with. Yes, I loved it. I loved it. Together in London. But that came from that work, which in the end, again, someone looks at, oh, that's crazy. Yeah, it uses light and it uses sound and it's really clever. Mm-hmm. And, you know, mm-hmm. But actually, it was that one, it was the calling of that of, of something this big, mm-hmm. of a tiny mark this big. That's, that, that's where it began. And there are various things within, based upon the piece called The Lost Fragment, a single tiny stone. Again, out up in the eye of the sky with all of that inspiration, all that grandeur, and vastness of scale and ancientness of whatever it was. One tiny story about this thing that said, Could you fix me? I could, would, could you repair me? And actually, in that repairing, again, I understood that it was, it was, it was speaking, you know, and saying, Well, you know, here I am again as nature. I'm, you, you perceive me as broken and you can repair me. But look, Repair me. It's beautiful and it's beautifully engineered with all of your deafness and craft and all of your brilliant human creativity. But look, it's still, it's still rather prosthetic, isn't it? Because you can't recreate millions of years of granite, even though what you shaped in bronze has this beautiful bronze. You know, it, even though you shaped is beautiful, it's it's you can't you can't you can't re, you can't do what I can do as a you know the the, the creative level of of nature itself, um, and. That's taken time because there's a, the critic in the head is saying, better monetize this, better be impressive, people are better like this. And you can't, that's never there. Mm. Um, so I think for me, having done, you know, bits of meditation work and other ways of, you know, other, other ways of, of, of trying to open and connect um, to create that space and to create a subtlety of awareness that I can notice when something lands has been really, has been really, really valuable. Literally. Principle one is trust that when it lands, it's going to be odd. Mm-hmm. It's going to seem odd. It's going to seem almost meaningless. It's it's not going to look or feel anything like a finished piece of work. But see whether or not something in you says, I'm interested. Some part of me is, finds that fascinating. I share it to you early in the world to tell me that's not art. That's not it's whatever. If I hear my the voice of my parents or my teachers, they're going to say, well, what are you thinking about that? If I think about putting it out into my tribe on social media, I'm thinking, oh, is this going to be acceptable? Is this going to fit with the norms of the parameters in which it's okay to think and speak and whatever? There's all of these pressures that are limiting our ability to be authentic and trust something which is innocuous and odd and uniquely ours. But if we can learn to recognize it and we can learn to give it 
that little bit of space, what we'll see is it starts to grow and we can kind of be the garden, if you like, or the gardener, but we're not, we didn't make the seed, mm -hmm. you know? And if we're not making the seed, then where is the seed coming from? These things that land, where is that coming from? And if we accept that I don't need to, I just, I, it doesn't need to be a product of my intelligence or my advanced skills. I can simply be open to it and I create that space allow it to land, allow it to give a little bit of space, then I become, I become that channel, you know? And I think you like, if, when we shift our attention to creativity, not being about human ingenuity, mm -hmm. but actually being a resource, an energy, which is outside of ourselves, which we can channel or be a node on the network for a conduit for, then we start to really recognize its vast potential. And we start asking ourselves, what might its potential be if those of us closed that have decided I'm not creative, you know, or that's a stupid idea. What if those people start to open a little, just a little, 8 billion people, doesn't need to be much, just open a tiny bit and some more starts to come and come through. Is there this fast resource that we haven't learned to tap yet? Is it like the days before we understood wind power or solar power? It was all there. We didn't invent solar energy. We didn't invent wind power, but we did learn how we're learning how to channel it. What if it's the same with creativity? What does that then mean if we all become our own version of a, of a cell um, through which this can pass? What, what would that impact be? And that's a good question to ask yourself after listening to this podcast. If you become that, what will be the impact of all of that? Thank you so much, Ian. It was such an exciting, beautiful, learningful, mesmerizing conversation to listen to you talk about creativity. I'm also aware that we need to record part two because there's a lot of conversations about what is the AI impact of creativity nowadays. And I would I'd love to invite you to the second part of this later on in the year when we talk about that because it's that's a big topic in itself, as I feel right now that the human creativity and who we are as a human being is more precious and important than ever before right now. I think that we need to cultivate it, preserve it, keep it, maintain it, nourish it, give it space, because that's what makes us human. And in this new age of technological, I would say insanity, it's not only revolution, it's also insanity. We need to maintain and preserve this aspect of ourselves. So thank you so much for empowering us. And thank you so much for empowering the audience to reconnect back to themselves. Of course, we're going to uh, reference all your social medias and your websites to the people who want to know more about you. Once again, thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you so much for your beautiful presence. And everybody, thank you so much for listening and tuning in to our podcast for this week. And uh, bye for now. Yeah, see you soon. Thank you, Zora. Right.